Hi everyone, my name is Grant and I'm the lead pastor of the Summit community. And we're grateful that you're engaging with this resource today. And our, our heart is that it's encouraging, that it's challenging and meaningful to you as a follower of Jesus. And to that end, we think that following Jesus is actually best done in the context of community. So this, this recorded sermon is intended to just be supplemental. And if there's anything we can do to help you uh, further engage in community and following Jesus with others, please let us know and we'd love to support that. So uh, as we open the word this morning or today, we hope that it blesses you. Thank you for coming this morning. We've got some wonderful things to cover today. All right. You know, I saw a movie <clears throat> earlier this week. How many of you have seen the movie The Princess Bride? Yeah, I see all the, la it's a classic, isn't it? It's really one of my favorite movies of all, of all times. For those that have never seen it, it, it starts off with a boy who's home from school. He's sick, not feeling well. And so he's home from school. And his grandfather comes to be with him and brings a book. And he says to the young boy that he's going to go ahead and read a book. And the boy's less than excited about that. He's like 10 or 11. He's like, I'm not a baby. Don't read me a book. And the grandfather says to him, but it's a great book. It's about fighting and torture, and revenge, and giants. There's monsters, and chases, and escapes. There's true love, and there's miracles. And with that, the story begins. Now, now, how many of you have never, you've never seen The Princess Bride? Can I see your hands? You've never, <sighs> inconceivable. <laughs> For those that have never seen it, you'll need to watch the movie to catch that reference, okay? Invite me over, I'd be glad to join you. I'll bring the popcorn. Now, today, today, our passage that we're going to cover is about friendship, and it's about betrayal, and it's also about servanthood and impending torture and pain, about confusion and regrets, miracles, and of course, true love, a true love that's lasted for 2,000 years and will till the end of time. I've titled this message, The Everlasting Promise. The Everlasting Promise. Now we've been in the book of Matthew over the last few months, talking about the life of Jesus. We've talked about his lineage, the calling of the disciples, the importance of serving. We've talked about over 20 uh, healing miracles that have occurred in the book of Matthew. We've also had a chance to see Jesus' conflict with the religious leaders, as well as him teaching life principles to us. And most recently, the unveiling of him as the Messiah. Now, our scripture passage today is perhaps the second greatest event in the entire Bible outside of the resurrection. This single event, this single night, has been remembered throughout history. Jesus would be crucified and resurrected just days after this. At the time it happened, there were some that thought it was the beginning of the end. But really, it was the beginning of the beginning of a new relationship with God. And it all begins in Matthew chapter 26, verse 2. And so if you want to go ahead and either get out your phones or your Bibles, or uh, scripture should be behind us. Yes, very good. And we will have a chance to go over that as well. So Matthew 20, uh, 26. Perfect. Oh, see, I'm going to have to try and do this myself here. All right. See, you're all set and I'm not. There we go. As you know, he says to his disciples, Passover begins in two days, and the Son of Man will be handed over and crucified. Yeah, what a thing to say to somebody. It must have been a tense time. And as they waited those two days for Passover to come, they were a little unnerved. They were a little unnerved. And our scriptures today are going to cover Matthew 26, verses 17 through 29. So let me read the first part. It's the time of the Passover, okay? And we're going to read this first part as far as Matthew on verse 17. Thank you very much for putting that up. We're all set. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to prepare the Passover meal for you? 
As you go into the city, he told them, you will see a certain man. Tell him, the teacher says, my time has come and I will eat the Passover meal with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus told them and prepared the Passover meal there. So it's the time of the Passover. The Passover is celebrated every year by the Jewish people. It's in the spring. The story of it's found in the book of Exodus. And for those that aren't familiar with it, let me just take a moment and recap it. The Hebrew people are in captivity in Egypt. They've been slaves for hundreds of years. And God calls Moses to be the deliverer and sends him to Egypt to talk to the Pharaoh who's over the land. And Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let God's people go. And if not, a series of plagues will overcome the land. Pharaoh says no. And in fact, the plagues ensue. Pharaoh continues to say no. And then God says, I'm going to send a last plague. It's the plague of death. And it will come upon on the land and it will touch every household in the land and someone will die in the household. But Moses tells the Jewish people, you are to avoid that by going and finding a lamb. And you'll find a lamb that's spotless, a lamb that's without blemish, a lamb that there's no defect or marks on it. And we call it now sinless. And you're to take this lamb and sacrifice it to God. And then you take the blood and you're going to put the blood on the doorposts of the house. So that when this spirit of death comes upon the land, it will pass over the homes that have blood on it. Thus, we get the name Passover. Well, that's what happens. Pharaoh wakes up the next day to death all around his land, tells the Jewish people, get out of here. And they leave in haste. They leave in haste, in such haste that they didn't even have time to put yeast or leaven in the bread that they baked in the sun, and it didn't rise. And it became a flat cracker, and it looked much like this. And this is matzah. And this is what the Jewish people eat on Passover in remembrance of being in slavery and being freed and having to run through so quickly out of time and not being able to have your bread raised. It doesn't taste real good, just so you know. <clears throat> now, some of you may wonder, why did we have to have blood on the door? I mean, didn't God know? It's God. Didn't he know where the Jewish people lived? <laughs> of course he did. It wasn't for God. It was for the Jewish people. I did research and found that archaeologists have found remnants from that time frame and period of time. And they have found homes and they have found the brick and mortars of the doors, etc. And on those doors, they have been scratched and inscribed symbols. And some of the symbols were idols that they would worship, animals they would worship, or their names were scratched. Now, the Jewish people lived in captivity for so many years that they became assimilated into the culture. And some of them began to follow the pagan culture. And they would put symbols on their doors and they scratched their names on the doors. So God had them take a lamb, the blood, and put it on the doorposts of their house to cover up their sin of scrawling the pagan gods, of covering up their name and giving them a forgiveness of their sins so that they could leave. Now, this is what we call a foreshadowing. It's a foreshadowing, a beginning, a looking ahead of the blood of the Messiah, which covers our sins. The Bible states that by the blood, we're redeemed. We can overcome by the blood of the lamb. In fact, the Bible says there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. And it's Jesus' blood that brings our freedom. Now, some of you know I was raised in a Jewish home. So I celebrated a lot of Passovers. And Passover was a time of, of enjoyment. We had family and friends and you had a ceremony and it was a lot of fun. And during that ceremony, you drink four cups of wine. They're all significant, okay? Kids, you drink grape juice. I have three brothers and one year, one of my brothers turned to me and challenged me to drink wine instead of the grape juice. I was always up for a good challenge. Come on, I was eight years old. I could handle it. So during the ceremony, instead of doing, it was about an ounce or two of wine. Each time I would secretly fill up with the wine. And by the end of the evening, I wasn't feeling real well. 
So I went and laid down in the room and it didn't really help too much. And all of a sudden I felt like I had to race into the bathroom, which I did. In the bathroom was my oldest brother who was getting ready to go out on a date. And in those days they dressed up. He had a sport coat on and a tie and ready to go out. I did not make it to the bathroom. I threw up all over my brother. <laughs> I would not be standing here today if my mom and dad would not have intervened. I want to let you know. Now, this week, I'm going to a family reunion where my family, who lives around the country, we're all going to gather together. And I will see my oldest brother, who I'm very close to. We're very, very close. I've thought about bringing up the idea of asking him if, what he remembers about that night. Bad, no worry, I'm going to have my 98-year-old mom right next to me, and she will protect me in case he does remember that too vividly. All right? But all kidding aside, actually, Passover holds deep significance in Jewish tradition. You see, it's a time that we reflect on liberation and freedom from oppression and God releasing us. And while Moses delivered the Israelites from captivity and oppression, Jesus frees us from captivity and oppression. In fact, the Jewish oppression and slavery in Egypt really is just symbolism or a metaphor of what takes place in, the, in our lives today. Anybody in here ever felt like they walked in oppression? Just the anxiety of life? It's like being in Egypt. And God tells us that he was sacrificed for our freedom. Is it any wonder that Jesus told, uh, took this occasion, Passover, as the day to talk about him being the Messiah and revealing himself to his disciples? He is the Passover lamb. He redeems all people. In Isaiah chapter 53, the Messiah is likened to a lamb led to slaughter. In John chapter one, it says that upon seeing Jesus, he says, behold, behold the lamb of God. And in 1 Corinthians chapter five, Paul says Jesus is the Passover lamb. Now, back to today's scripture. Two days have passed since Jesus told him he'd be crucified, and now it's the Passover. And the disciples were gathered with Jesus, and they're ready to celebrate it, and they do a ceremony. And you perform certain rituals with Exodus as the foundation. In fact, Exodus is a story of unstoppable redemption. But Jesus is about to do a new order of redemption. You see, previously to that night, lambs had been sacrificed every year in the land during Passover because it was a remembrance of what took place in Egypt. But now, only one more sacrifice would ever be needed and Jesus would be the final sacrificial lamb. So they drink the first of four cups of wine. And the first one is called the cup of sanctification. The cup of sanctification. And this cup of sanctification is one that talks, to, uh, that talks from Exodus about the importance of God freeing us. So we read in Exodus chapter 6, verse 6, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression. Now, God, Jesus is talking, going to talk to us about freeing us from bondage of thinking, bondage of habit patterns. Jesus is looking to the future of what he's going to do for us. And then later, a second glass is drunk, and it's called the cup of deliverance. The cup of deliverance. I will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to free you and rescue you from your slavery today in your life. And then, in the order of the service, the meal is eaten. And we're going to pick up in Matthew 20, 21. When it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the 12. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. What? I mean, I know they'd heard two days earlier that one of them was going to do something, he was going to be crucified, but it's been two days. It seemed like a long time ago. And now they were sitting having a good time. 
They were talking and laughing and eating and everything was wonderful. And now Jesus turns and literally says, one of you will betray me. One of you is responsible for what's going to happen. Now, let me summarize the next few verses for you. The disciples, in amazing humility, do not turn and, at everybody and say, you know how it is when something, somebody says something it's going to happen, you look around like, well, who did it? Who did that? They weren't sitting around going, no. The Bible says they said things like, is it me? Am I the one? Is there something inside of me? Isn't that amazing? What humility. And Jesus says, one of you will be the one. And at that point, Judas, who was the one that would betray Jesus, says, surely you don't mean me. And Jesus says, it's as you say. Now, in the book of Luke, in the book of John, it says that at that moment, Judas got up and left. And then the disciples thought he was going to go out and buy some more food or something. And so Judas was no longer part of the ceremony at that point. I wonder what the other disciples felt at that time. What kind of confusion was on them? Denial or shock. I, I don't know. What a, what a time. I do know this, though. There was an aroma of betrayal in the air. But on their hearts and in their mind was still the lingering of freedom from captivity that this ceremony was all about. Chapter 20, verse 26 of chapter 26. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. And he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, take it and eat this. This is my body. Jesus took this bread, the Bible says, and blessed it. Boruch atoranoi. Eloheinu melech ho'olam. Hamotzi lechem min ho'oretz. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gives us the bread from the earth. And the Bible says, he took this. He broke it. And he gave it to the disciples and he said, take this bread and eat it. This is my body broken for you. And do this in remembrance of me. Jesus just performed a memorial of himself. Now I want you to hear something. This is not a new ceremony to them. They grew up with this. All the disciples had been through the ceremony. They'd been through the ceremony a couple times with Jesus already. But Jesus takes a departure. You see, this bread, this bread represents what happened in Egypt and the suffering. Deuteronomy 16.3 says this is the bread of affliction. The bread of affliction. See, Jesus is saying no longer will this bread represent the affliction of the Hebrew people in Egypt. Now, this bread will represent my affliction and my suffering. When we take the bread, we remember the body that was broken. We remember the suffering and the horrors of Jesus. We remember the mocking and the whipping and the scourging. We remember the crown of thorns that was taken and placed upon his head. We remember the nails driven into his hands and feet and placed on the cross and lifted up and suffering. He gave up his body. He gave up his life. And this bread, the heaviness of what he did, every time we take communion, we should remember what Jesus did for us in the brokenness of his body. Verses 27 and 28. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. He lifted up the third cup. How do I know it's the third cup? Because the third cup in the ceremony is taken right after the meal. 
And Jesus just completed the meal with the breaking of the bread. And he lifts the cup and he says, Boruch HaToronoi, Eloheinu Melech Olam, Borei Pri Amen. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who gives us the fruit of the vine. And when he was finished playing, this, this cup right here, this cup right here is called the cup of redemption. The cup of redemption or the cup of blessing. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and a great act of judgment we recite from Exodus. He's going to lift us up. He's going to hold us up. He's going to protect us. This is the third cup. And when he was finished praying, he took that cup and he gave it to each of the disciples, telling them to drink it. I want you to know that was a radical departure. Everybody has their own cup. Everybody drinks from their own cup. Everybody prays their own prayer. They drink from their own cup. And Jesus is now saying, no, this is my cup and you are going to drink from it. You will commune with me and we will drink from this together. And he says again, for this is my blood of the covenant. This is my promise to you, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The cup of redemption, a redemption more costly than anything we can comprehend. You see, there's all, the only way we can be redeemed, the only way we can be freed, the only way we can be delivered from sin is by the death of a spotless and sinless Lamb of God. And Jesus would be that sacrifice for us. This is an unimaginable transaction. We gained our lives because he lost his. Now I know that there's no blood on houses today. At least I hope there isn't any blood on your houses today on the doorposts. But the Bible says that our bodies are a temple of God. And so as Christians, we do have blood on the doorposts of our hearts. On the doorposts of our hearts. And in contrast to the depth of sorrow that we would have when we take this bread and we think about his body and the suffering, the joy that we have and the everlasting promise of the covenant, the hope and the lightness we have when we take this cup and drink of the juice or the wine. What God has done for us is amazing, but we're not done. We're not done. You see, there was one cup that wasn't drunk that night. Remember I told you there were four cups. This is just the third cup. The final cup finishes the meal. It ends it all. The ceremony's over. We read it in Matthew 26, verse 29. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You see, this fourth cup, this fourth cup, is what we call the cup of restoration or praise and hope. The Bible says this, I will claim you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. He claims us. He restores us. What he's saying is, you belong to me and I belong to you. We're in this together. And later he says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit as a comforter, as a counselor, as an encourager, as a helper. And you will be endued with power beyond anything you've ever known. With power and authority, you will do greater things than me, he says. Because of our restoration. This fourth cup is written in a different tense. The other three cups are all about the past, what happened in Egypt. But scholars agree that this fourth cup speaks to the future. It speaks to the Messiah. It speaks to what God says, we will drink with him. He will not drink of it 
until we drink with him in our Father's kingdom where we will be fully restored and we will be filled with praise and hope. The bread makes us sorrowful, but the blood covenant helps us rejoice. The death of Jesus can make us sorrowful, but his resurrection always gives us hope. Our own impending death or the death of loved ones may make us sorrowful, but because of Jesus, we will be raised up with him and in this, we should always rejoice. What an amazing story. This last week, as I was going through this and going over, and I just, the depth of what God did for us is just amazing. It's, it's really beyond belief. It's inconceivable. From oppression to freedom. That's my story. God said, I will free you. I will rescue you. I will redeem you. And I claim you and restore you. Through Moses in the Old Testament, God prepared us for Jesus to walk us into freedom. So let me ask you, do you have blood on the doorposts of your heart? You see, our sin, our shame, our guilt, our pain, our confusion, all can be covered by the blood of the Lamb, by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And what better thing to do after hearing that than to have communion? So if you'd go ahead and get your communion cups, the first layer is the wafer, the second is the juice. I want this message to sink in. I want to really have your hearts turned towards God. And so I'm going to say this. If there's anybody in here that has never really received God as your Lord and Savior, you maybe were raised in a religious home. Maybe you did some things, but you never really had that relationship with God that was really permanent, one that was personal, where he walked along you as your friend. I want to give you a chance in just a few moments to do that. You'll repeat after me, and I want to lead you in a, a salvation message. Or maybe you know the Lord, but you've walked away. Maybe you veered off, you took turns, left, right, and you're sitting there thinking, I am so far away from the cross than I've ever been. I, I've known some of these things, but I just, I haven't been there in a while. I'm going to ask you and invite you to share this and recite after me as well. And maybe some of you are just there thinking, I love the Lord, but I'm going to recommit. God, I'm going to rededicate my life this very moment to you to follow you and have that blood on the doorposts of my heart. And so with that, if you would just close your eyes, repeat after me. Father in heaven, I receive Jesus into my life as Lord and Savior. I give you my hurts, pain, and confusion. Be my God and guide. Thank you for your cleansing blood. Thank you for the cross. I am a child of God. In your name, amen. Would you please stand and join us as we sing?
God, this is your body you broke for us. For us, Lord, and we remember that and we thank you for that sacrifice. With that, let's take that. But Lord, oh Lord, your promise, your covenant through your blood covers those areas of my life, Lord, as I come in repentance to you and I thank you and I just am so glory in what you've done in our lives, God. And with that, let's take the cup. In a moment, a prayer team will come forward. If you need prayer, something in your life, maybe you accepted Jesus today. Maybe you have turned a corner and went ahead back to the Lord. Maybe you're struggling in areas of health or finances, relationship. There's a prayer team that'll be here. They want to pray for you. We talk about community. We want to carry the burden with you and pray for you. So please, when the service is over, be good Washingtonians and swim upstream and come up here and get prayer. I want to tell you, you are free. You are rescued. You are redeemed. And you are restored. I want you to go forth in the fullness of God. Bless those around you and know that you are a son or daughter of the King. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. So glad that you joined us today. We hope that you have been filled up, challenged, encouraged by what you heard. Our desire for you is that this resource be used in conjunction with you belonging to a local church so that you can grow in the context of community. Following Jesus isn't something that we're meant to do alone. So if something from worship or the message was stirred up inside you today as you listened, we encourage you to bring others into that. Tell the story of what God is speaking to you and what he's leading you to. If you're in the Spokane area, we would love for you to join us in person for services. If you have questions or you need prayer, you can fill out a Connect card on our website and a member from our team will reach out to you. You'll also see opportunities there to join a community group, to get baptized, or to get involved in, by serving with us. If you're not local, we encourage you to get connected with a church that's near you so that you can follow Jesus with others and grow in your faith and be transformed into the image and likeness of Christ. For other opportunities to connect with us, you can check out our website or look for us on social media. We love you all. Hope you join us again.